All right, and we are live. Welcome back, everyone, to the Indie Music Academy, the channel where we uncover the mysteries of the music industry, learn how to grow a larger fan base, and learn how to earn an income from our music. And today I have a very special guest. I have Mike Gormley with us, who is an artist manager, a journalist, a, uh, uh, I'm forgetting everything, an A&R rep at a record label. Uh, he just does so much. He has over a 40-year career in the music industry. He's worked with artists such as Supertramp, Danny Elfman, The Bangles, The Police. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, his credits are nearly endless. We're so glad to have you today, Mike. Thanks so Thanks, much. Thanks, Ryan. For Great to be here. here with us today. Now, if you're watching live, you have a special opportunity to join the conversation in the chat. So right now, uh, since we're just starting the stream, why don't you just drop your name in and say hello. We love knowing who's here with us. And uh, if you can just say your name, uh, just say a quick hello to Mike. Uh, let's just uh, all get to know each other. And we want to know that you're here as well. And we will be taking your questions today, which is a great opportunity for you. Um, so if you have any questions, drop them in. We're going to have a Q&A time at the end. Uh, but we do like having the questions to pile up so that we can just knock them out uh, all at once. And so with that, uh, I'm just going to hand it over to Mike, who uh, is going to just share a little bit about himself. Uh, maybe some of you watching have not heard of Mike yet, but uh, you're about to. So it's going to be awesome. So, Mike, uh, why don't you just share a little bit about your background in the music industry, uh, just for someone who maybe is meeting you for the first time? Well, first... <clears throat> First, I'll apologize for this ghost-like image that, that we have here. <laughs> I have weird lighting in this room, and I thought I'd kind of taken care of it. And it's, uh, I, you know, I, I can kind of float around like a ghost. And uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I'm not usually quite this uh, this bright, you know. I, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm Irish, and I can't go out in the sun normally, but it's not this bad. It's it's, it's, the, <laughs> it's the lighting. So um, anyway, um, so you want to hear about some of the stuff I've been doing. <laughs> some of the stuff, yeah, just update us. <laughs> well, uh, you know, um, I, I didn't, uh, it's funny, you know, I, I didn't really plan my career. Uh, it just, mm. things just happened. I, I at, a, at age, I think it was about 18, I was in the, I was from Canada, from Ottawa, but I was in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, this was in the 60s when the Bay Area was beaming. And um, I went to a I went to a show. I think I paid a dollar fifty for a seat about a mile away from the stage. But it was um, uh, Sonny and Cher, uh, Dionne Warwick, the Bo mm -hmm. Brummels, all, all these great bands of uh, artists of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a full orchestra with two drummers and Phil Spector conducting. Wow. And I thought I got to write this down, and I and I did, and I wrote it to uh, wrote it to or sent it to an editor I knew at the Ottawa Journal, a morning newspaper there, and he printed it and said, "You got any more?" So I just mm. started going and doing interviews of these bands that were coming through the Bay Area at the time, and you know that included the Birds and Buffalo Springfield and uh, mm. Everly Brothers and great stuff like that. Yeah, and that just led to um, a gig at the Detroit Free Press. Which mm -hmm. was another morning newspaper, a huge paper, and 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 that that just expanded that vision, and then um, for reasons I still don't know, uh, somebody asked me to be uh, head of publicity for Mercury Records, and mm -hmm. I never really had done publicity before. I had people working for me that knew more about it than I did, but uh, but I took it because it was uh, headquarters were in Chicago and uh, with a lot more money. So I said okay, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I have a blog on my website that tells the story of my first day at Mercury Records, which is kind of funny and involves Rod Stewart, who was an up and coming artist then. But mm -hmm. not too many months later, we released Every Picture Tells a Story, which included the song Maggie May. And so I basically dove into the deep end of the pool or into the fire, mm -hmm. depending on how you look at it, and, and worked with him for the next five years and learned as I went along. And um, awesome. So it was, it was it was fun and it was nerve wracking, but it was uh, my first actual week there. There was a, a party for a new band they had signed called Uriah Heep, uh, mm. which is a, which is a, a very important band in the heavy metal world as as beginners of, of that genre to some degree. 
for sure. And uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what was going on at this party. I hadn't put it together, and it was it was it it. I thought it was going to be a complete tragedy, and it, it ended up just being a good party. Everybody had a good time, and I came mm-hmm. out of it relatively unscathed and pretty close to that band for the rest of the time. So That's anyway, uh, that was that beginning, and that led to uh, A&M Records uh, seven or eight years mm-hmm. later. And um, so I started at Mercury Records, and Rod Stewart released, you know, started taking off. Mm-hmm. I got to A&M Records, and the police started taking off. Wow. But by the time I got to um, by the time I got to A and M, I'd already worked with uh, Rod and and Rush mm. and uh, Backman Turner Overdrive and mm. so great some great artists. So wow. I, I knew a little more about what I was doing by the time I got to A. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, ended up working with the police and and then eventually became partners with their manager Miles Copeland and started a management company. And the management company was. Um, uh, LA based bands it was uh, Oingo Boingo and Wall of Voodoo. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, about six months into our company, we found the Bangles and mm-hmm. uh, worked with them for. So I, I did those, mainly those three bands for, for most of the 80s. And, yeah. um, and, par, and the whole part of the whole police extravaganza and everything. It was great, great fun and, and rewarding. It went on from there and then. Then Miles decided to go produce some really bad movies, and <laughs> and, and I was left uh, holding the company. Bangle wow. broke up, Walla Voodoo broke up, but Oingo Boingo kept going. And then I, I talked Danny Elfman to this idea of becoming a composer, film composer. Um, he, he, he'd been offered um, uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Pee, uh, Pee Wee Herman's first movie, great movie, mm-hmm. and um, and I. Danny and I went to a meeting at Warner Brothers one Friday night and met with everybody. And, and they were, it was Pee Wee's first movie. It was Tim Burton's first movie. Uh, Danny's first movie. It was all pretty exciting. Although on Saturday, Danny called me and said, you got to get me out of this. I don't know how to <laughs> score movies. I don't know what they're talking about. I said, well, at least give me a Monday to figure out some things. So we worked out some things that made him feel comfortable and he decided to do it. And then he wrote that brilliant score and off he went yeah. in his career. Uh, wow, things like that would, things like that would happen. They just, I, 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 of course, take credit for it all, but just kind of, just kind of happens sometimes. Interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, that's. So I'm sensing a theme here, which obviously, um, you know, the audience knows this is typical. But we, you know, we planned out, you know, this call and we talked about some themes that we can bring to you guys watching. Uh, just to help you guys out, help organize your thoughts, help to figure out how you should approach the music industry. Because a lot of the audience members are are just starting out, and um, you know you've, you've brought up a lot of great points. And one of those themes is, you know, it's clear. Don't be afraid to just dive in. You said that multiple times at the record label. Uh, you know, convincing Danny Elfman to start film scoring. He doesn't know what he's doing in the beginning, and he's self conscious, but. I mean, we know the end of the story. It works out. It worked out for you. And so what do you have to say to the people listening? Oh, and Rod Stewart as well. Uh, What do you have to say to the people listening who maybe are just afraid to dive in or afraid that they maybe don't have the right skills? Sorry, my phone's ringing. I'm trying to turn it off. I didn't prepare very well here. Sorry. It's okay. Okay, now. Um, uh, Well, the... Learn by fire. You know, it happens a lot in the mm-hmm. music industry. The music mm-hmm. industry, and, and maybe it does in other industries as well, but um, some industries are very strict. You know, you got to have a, you got to be almost PhD to get in the front door. Um, yeah. uh, the music industry, maybe not quite as much as it used to be, but uh, gay, it gives people opportunities and, and they know you're learning, you know, so. Mm-hmm. I mean, I came in as head of publicity. I came in as an executive of the company, <laughs> and I didn't know what it was. I still, I, I just don't have an answer for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just did, and uh, and I just, I said okay, you know. I mean, it, it, it and but I, I had been a journalist for some years. I knew the the way it, the basics, and I knew I'd be approached by publicists about stories. I knew how it worked to some degree. And and um, 
uh, I just put that to use. I was sitting in my office at Mercury Records in Chicago, and outside the window of my office was the Playboy building. And in those days, Playboy magazine had like 7 million readers and supposedly like a 27 million pass on rate. And I looked at that and went, I should probably get to know those people. (laughs) And I, and I, I called them up and they invited me over and they turned out to be great people. And they weren't, I was expecting, you know, Hugh Hefner type guys. It was a bunch of hippies. There's a bunch of really good writers who had got a good gig at at Playboy and, and, uh, Uh, and, you know, they joke about the reading Playboy for the stories, but there were great stories in that magazine and great interviews in that magazine. Um, so they ended up doing a story on Rod Stewart. And only later did I find out that they had never done anything but a jazz artist before. He was the first oh. non-jazz artist they did a story on. I didn't know that. But, you know, if... Yeah. if, if, if the motto of my company is um, activity breeds activity. Hmm. If you don't do it, it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. If you do do it, maybe you'll do it wrong. Maybe uh, you'll learn by doing it. Um, maybe you'll do it right, whatever. But if you don't do it, nothing's going to happen. So uh, yeah. if you get an opportunity, you got to jump on it. And and um, sure, within reason, say say yes, but not too much reason. Just give yourself mm-hmm. a break and, and believe in yourself. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't know why I was hired to head of publicity at Mercury Records, and, and I didn't care. I I just said yes, and yeah. I, I probably scared the hell out of some of the other executives there in the sense that I, I remember there was a a situation where I was I was in New York and they were very strict about uh, daytime hours. Even if you were out at a concert the night before till three in the morning, they expected you in the office by nine or nine thirty. Yeah. They also expected you to not fly or travel or whatever during the day. You're in the mm-hmm. office, you're working. If you have to go somewhere, you go in the evening. Well, mm-hmm. I was in New York and I was having, I was supposed to go to Rochester, New York to see a, uh, then a new musician named Chuck Manzoni um, mm-hmm. and who went on to great success on A&M records. Um, mm-hmm. And I found out that a writer from Rolling Stone, who I did not know, but we'd invited to the gig in Rochester, was going on the 3 o'clock, uh, 3 p.m. flight. So I changed to that flight just to get to meet him and, and know him a little bit. Yeah. I was The next week, I was called into the president's office. And in retrospect, I think they were going to fire me huh. by, by going against their rules. And he said, so why'd you do that? And I said, well, because this guy was going to be on the flight and I wanted to get to know him. And, they, and he looked at the vice president who was sitting there and went, meeting's over. <laughs> you know, it was like, I had a logical reason for it. So, yeah. you know, you got to think on your feet and you got to believe you, that you're right. And, mm-hmm. you know, you take your shots though. You take you take a mm-hmm. chance to not be an understanding boss. Um, yeah. However, uh, you know, things like that would, would go down. So you got to, um, you know, I get so many people approaching me about their music and their career and so on and so forth. And you can tell when somebody's uh, feeding you lines and you can tell when somebody's really got their shit together. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can tell. Uh, and uh, I love the idea of helping where I can. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, um, and I'm not in, I, I'm not, I'm managing bands. I'm managing a, a great, what do they, what do they call them now? Uh, artists, of, uh, um, legacy artists. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm managing a great uh, Jeff Skunk Baxter, who's uh-huh. a, a member of the um, uh, um, the uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a member of the Doobie Brothers, and before that, it was a founding member of Steely Band, the Steely Dan, too mm-hmm. amazing. And he's he's recorded a new album, and I've signed him to a a, a major label, and he, he's he's getting uh, he's never stopped. But um, yeah. Yeah. And the reason I bring that up is is um, I can I know there's something I can develop there. There is a he's in a situation in his career. He's not you know he just. He just got elected into the Hall of Fame, so it's not like he was gone. Uh, right. but, but he he was quiet, and and mm-hmm. now I can I can develop something uh, uh, 
uh, his, I don't know, third phase of his career, something like that. Um, and I just feel I can do it. I just feel good about doing that. And then I worked with a brand new artist named Strictly Elizabeth, a band named Strictly Elizabeth. And and I've uh, been working with them for about six months and all kinds of things are happening for them. And it's, I don't, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm putting in my two cents, but it's because of their talent and their hard work that things are, are going well. But I could tell that along with great music, the hard work was there and I knew they weren't feeding me a line about anything. I knew they were going to work the way they need to. And so, yeah. I, yeah, so they're they're starting to do well, particularly at the college radio. Yeah, that's actually a great uh, transition to something I wanted to bring up. You know, you mentioned hard work, and you know the you can tell the difference between someone who's legit and someone who's just feeding lines. And there's not a band that I think worked harder and did it more on their own than Rush. You know, yeah. they were always turned down on radio, and yeah. they it's such a great story. And um, I think that there's a, a clear point of encouragement that even though you might get turned down time and time and again, you still have your fans. And so um, I just want to ask you, like, what, what was it about Rush that allowed their fans to push them to the top? And what can we learn from them? Their, their fans recognize their talent and their music mm -hmm. before, before anybody. Uh, <laughs> I, I was flabbergasted. I went with Rush to um, someplace outside Chicago. I can't remember exactly what city, um, mm -hmm. but an hour out of Chicago. And this was very early in their career. And you're right, no radio, no radio would touch them. The media, the press wouldn't touch them. I mm -hmm. couldn't get any stories done on them. Wow. And, and uh, I was finding all kinds of angles. And I went to the concert to me, is a relatively unknown band at this point. Yeah. They had something like 1,500 people at the concert in this city outside of Chicago. I want to, how the hell, the, and they even find out about them. How they <laughs> even hear about them, let alone 15, how many bands at that level in their career would die for 1,500 people to show up at a concert? And <laughs> and they, you know, and they did their show and they uh, the people were going crazy. Yeah. And, um, the only answer I have is for their talent, but also their, they were focused. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil was a drummer, but he was also had the, that insight for the lyrics that he wrote. And I think the lyrics meant a lot to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they could present it well with their musical talent. And mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, just, it's a good example of a band not giving up and being supported by their fans and it just grew and grew and grew and mm -hmm. eventually the media couldn't ignore them right they're undeniable at that point yeah uh, they still didn't get the kind of airplay that that a band of that size would normally get they still don't mm -hmm. know i think one or two tracks get played but mm -hmm. uh uh it, it doesn't matter um and they're they they had their fans and their fans now are in the millions and um, but at that time, I, that, that first concert where I saw them, I was flabbergasted that that many people showed up and got the music immediately. They got it before I got it. I was listening. And, you know, it's fairly spacey. It's not regular rock and roll or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and so I was listening to I knew it on record, of course, but I was listening to them live. And it was different. It was just different and, and different in a good way. And yeah. uh, and their fans caught on to that long before anybody in media or anywhere did. Yeah, they were making a direct connection with the fan without any help from publications, radio. And a lot of artists have the mindset that it's like, oh, I just need to get this and then my career will take off. Or I just need to get signed or I just need to get this publication or get on this radio station. But it's such a good example that if you win a fan over one at a time with through your music, through the lyrics, the personality, the stories, it can really work when everyone's turning you down. I'll tell That's you a good inspiring. on this line, a police story. Hmm. The first time I saw them play was in uh, was east somewhere, I think Boston, but maybe, maybe not, but um, a little club. Yeah. There were three people on stage. There were four people in the audience. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. And they went out there. They made a conscious decision. We're going to go out and play like we're playing to a sold out stadium. And they and they 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 did. They did this great show. Um, in the audience, one of those four people was a college DJ who started playing the hell out of their music. And he went on to be a legendary DJ in the Boston area named Oedipus. And, um, uh, but he's, that's, that may have been the start of, of, of the police. And it was because he was in an audience of four people and they played like it was a stadium. And, yeah. and they, they believed, uh, that, that it was going to, it was going to, it was the right thing to do in their minds. It was the right thing to, we're here to play. We're playing for these four people. And it was a great, not counting me, by the way, I, I was, I didn't come myself as one of the four people because yeah. uh, it's kind of with them, but uh, still anyway, it's pretty, it's very cool. Yeah, that is speaking of the police. So you worked with miles Copeland at a and records and you've gotten to know the police a little bit. You're, you're still in a relationship with staying and his son and, and, you were telling me that a lot of a lot of what's going on behind the scenes at a record label, it's it's really relational. You know, it's about the friendships that you make. People just want to work with the people that they like. People, you know, want to work with their friends. And so, tell me a bit about you know how you got started at A and M. You know, the dynamics behind those relationships. Like, how does it work behind the scenes for people who? Are, maybe don't know who are tuning in. Um, how does it work? It's an, an not an easy question to answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you, you know, you've got to have a really good rapport with particularly the manager and with the band. If you can't, the band's mm -hmm. touring, the band's doing all kinds of things. You don't necessarily get to hang around the band that much. Uh, unless, like in the case of A and M, unless, unless they came to L.A. or with Mercury Records came to Chicago, or you you know you get out to see them because you'd want to you'd want to know them. Mm -hmm. But when you're when you're a brand new band, you know um, Miles did a smart thing when he first came to A and M with the Police. He signed them at A and M in England, and mm -hmm. he he brought them to the states with no support. A and M mm -hmm. didn't pay for the tour or get them uh, get them a van or anything like that they came on their own and um the four of them or five of them maybe i'm it, i don't know if miles traveled with them in, in the in the station wagon but there was there was the three members of the police and kim turner who was their tour manager and kind of co-manager he the four of them in a station wagon driving from town to town all over the united states losing money like crazy oh my gosh yeah Miles is their manager. Their booking agent uh, uh, is Miles's brother, uh -huh. Ian, Ian Copeland. Um, he's fairly fairly new in that he'd been an agent in England, but he was new to America. Although mm -hmm. he's American, by the way. So uh, the, yeah. three, the Copeland brothers are basically from Alabama, uh, but they grew up in Beirut in London and stuff. So um, because their dad was in the CIA which is where the name of the police came from. <laughs> it's, a, yeah. it's a good story. It's a real good yeah. story. And um, uh, anyway, they just, Miles said to the company, a and he said, uh, uh, don't need any support. We'll do it ourselves. Pro mm -hmm. One promise I want from you is that your people come out to see us. Because uh, yeah. he knew the police would sell themselves. And that's why I was at that gig. And that's why a lot of people saw the band and got turned on to this band musically and personally. Because mm -hmm. personally, they were, they were very cool guys. All three of them were just not, not nice guys and interesting guys and intelligent guys and, and very different personalities. But, you know, they sold themselves to the label. And then Roxanne started happening in the radio. And that's when a and kicked in and saw something happening and started started doing the promotion and so on so yeah. um but that's uh you know build a family around your music as you have on the screen there uh the police had a built-in family <laughs> you know they'd already uh they'd already been together for a while by the time they got to america but they yeah. kind of said 
they kind of said the AM send your people out. In other words, get them out and join our family. They didn't say yeah. those words, but that's what it was. It's become part of this. And we became part of it. They were fantastic, you know. And yeah. I mean, I liked Roxanne anyway. The, the the first time I talked to Miles, I called him in London because the PR photo that he had sent was the, the three of them at that time had blonde hair mm. and they dyed their hair blonde and they had leather jackets on. Mm. And I called him and I said, get them out of the leather jackets because um, radio in America at that time would have nothing to do with anything they thought was punk. Hmm. They looked kind of punk in this photo. I said, hmm. you, Rady, you're going to run into problems. You're, you're, the image is going to be wrong. And it, and he got other photos to me and eventually got me thousands of photos. Um, but uh, he was he was aware of that and he listened to that. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, they they were they were very cool guys. Very uh, interesting. And Miles is very smart, very smart guy. Um, yeah. He's, he's, uh, I mean, uh, when he asked me to become his partner, I was, I was like, whoa, really? That was, that was almost the same as Mercury going, you want to be head of publicity? I was like, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, uh, yeah, we, we worked well together. Um, That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And I got to know, of course, the members of the police really well. And I haven't, you know, I keep, I keep in touch with Stuart. I, I, bumped into Sting's son just before the pandemic. And the first time I'd met him, he was six months old. <laughs> now, now he just played the hotel cafe with his band. He's got a great, he's got a great voice. He's a great musician. Uh, yeah. Joe, Joe Strumner. So anyway, so yeah. still, the connections are there. That's right. The connections are the family. Yeah. And if, if anyone's thinking, how do I get connections? connections in the music industry it's just about building that family and getting people on board with what you're doing so a and m records is often called a family the a and m of the years that i was there the 70s and 80s mainly mm-hmm. it's still and a lot of us uh, still are in touch on facebook or wherever there used to be a bunch of us used to get together for a lunch or whatever but now people mm-hmm. have kind of spread out but um a and m there's a there is it's like a it's like a uh you know college you were all in a college dorm together or something like that <laughs> that's cool we, we support each other uh i let a bunch of them know i'm on today they may be here i don't know <laughs> you know uh, it's, yeah. uh, that even the even though even the people who worked at AM it felt like a family that's so good yeah and, and speaking of the people who are here uh, we have so many people who are tuned in uh who are just uh really enjoying it they're saying hi in the chat i'm not sure if you're seeing that uh, but it's uh, it's awesome. I can see that. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> and uh, we will get into uh, Q and A uh, soon. Uh, so drop your questions in the chat. Uh, I want to talk about one more thing with Mike before we go to your questions. But we love letting them uh, pile on, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can. Cool. Uh, the, the questions usually get pretty crazy towards the end because the questions are so good, and uh, we're just so lucky to have Mike here today with us. Uh, just sharing his expertise and so uh yeah keep them coming and you mentioned uh going back to uh the discussion you mentioned a lot of these opportunities that uh you've had in over your career they kind of found you right so getting asked to be head of publicity at the record label you were like oh my gosh you know why you know why but then you rose up to the occasion just like how we talked about earlier learn by fire same thing with getting asked uh, to uh, start a and m with uh, with uh, miles Copeland and uh, you're just like whoa there's just another big whoa moment and I think the theme that we can bring to the the people who are watching today is that there is a reason there is something that uh, that people saw in you right you said earlier that it was your journalist uh, journalism background right that uh, you know that you brought your expertise to the table and uh, and uh, and so it's it's about diversifying your efforts right a lot of us think that we just have to be super good at one thing you know and that's there are some times where that is really good but you found that the diversity of your skills it led to more opportunities because people were probably thinking correct me if i'm wrong people were probably thinking man this my guy he really can fill a gap that we have or he really can bring something else that's going to be super valuable. So uh, my question for you is, what do you think 
um, people should do who are trying to get opportunities? Should they diversify the way that you did? What is the wisdom that you can bring? Uh, you know, just looking back at your uh, well, long successful yeah. music career. You talk about focus on one thing that can be your anchor for what mm -hmm. other things you're going to do. I was very mm -hmm. conscious of the fact that even in when I was starting out that if, if this doesn't work out, I, I got to have other things to do. I didn't mm -hmm. mention before I was a journalist, I was a musician uh, mm -hmm. and I, I was a drummer and, mm -hmm. and I understood at least, you know, I was, I wasn't any, any hot band or anything but I understood what it was like to get on stage. I understood what it was like to be stared at by a bunch of people. I understood there are things you learn. You don't realize you're learning at that time. And of course you're learning to play better and so on and so forth. And you're learning to work with people. You know, you get in a band, uh, you may not even have known those people three months before, you know, and you've got to, you've got to learn how to, to work with, with people. So there were things I was learning along the way that I may not have realized at the time. And, and even when I, even as a journalist, I, I, I didn't study journalism. I, I, I wrote some stories and they got printed and then they wanted more stories. So I would suddenly, yeah. I was a journalist. Um, my fire. Yeah. And when I was a journalist, I actually wasn't thinking, oh, wouldn't it be nice to get into the music industry? Uh -huh. It came to me, you know, and, mm. and, uh, and I took the chance, but I, I knew I could deal with people. I, I, as I said, I knew what, PR people were like when they came to me uh, with their artists and and I knew the good ones and the ones that I I didn't pay attention to too much and that kind of thing so you know you're, you're learning as you go so you may think you're focusing on one thing but that one thing is teaching you a whole bunch of other things that you may or may not realize at the time uh, mm -hmm. and you and you got you got to make use of those um, and you may get called on to to make use of those um, yeah. So, um, but yeah, you definitely have to have, you know, in the old line when you're, you, you wanted to become a musician and your parents said, just go to school. So you have something to back to fall back on. Right. Well, school or no school, have something to fall back on <laughs> because not because of possible failure, because of possible opportunities. Wow. You know, yeah. The more, you, the more you know, the more valuable you are to yeah. corporations or, or whoever. You know, uh, and another example of that, too, is is Danny Elfman, right, in Oingo yeah. Boingo. But he took the chance on film scoring. I think we all know how that worked out. Um, and yeah. it's, it's another one of those things where it's like you're diversifying not because you're going to fail or because you don't believe that you have the skills, but it's just, it's, it's so many more, you know, you know, hooks in the, in the river, right? You're, you're casting out many more lines and, uh, and something could, can catch like doing the Pee Wee movie and, and working, uh, you know, in film probably longer than in the rock and roll band now at this point. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So well, now um, we've got an album coming out for the first time and, 20 years or something like that. I forgot really? he last did an album. He's got a, it's got one coming up. Uh, so uh, that should be interesting. I think he even does, I think he does one or two Boingo songs, which is not like him to hmm. look back. He doesn't normally, I'm sure they're entirely different than what they were. With <laughs> but, um, but I haven't, I haven't, I haven't heard it yet. Um, but, you know, and, and even, uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I'm even doing new things. Uh, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm some non-music things I'm involved in. Uh, uh, in the next couple of days, we're starting a channel called Gormley Talks, a YouTube channel. And it's, oh, just, yeah. me, it's just me telling some of these stories. It's, it, it's it, like, you know, some of the stuff I talked about today will be on Gormley Talks, but also times about That's days awesome. with Rod Stewart and days with the police and, yeah. Rush and so on. It's um, uh, so I, I you know, just try new things, you know? Yeah. It, I, if it, I got the opportunity, so I said, okay, let's do it. I got the opportunity to be on on your show today, and I yeah. said yes, right? I, I figured I'd not fall on my face. I didn't think I'd look like a ghost, though. I wasn't. <laughs> it's okay. But uh, yeah. I look like an old ghost, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, hey, your is your channel live right now where people can check it out? 
or yeah, not yet? I just Gormley talks. I, I, I yeah. it hasn't officially launched, but I, I think mm -hmm. there's just a promo on there at the moment. I don't think, but the first mm -hmm. one is going to be about uh, Oingo Boingo and, and Danny Elfman, That's and they only yeah, let yeah, them, 10 or 15 minutes long. Let's uh, let's all do Mike a favor. Open up a new tab and let's be the first subscribers on his new channel. Uh, okay. Just to just to give a, a little love over to Mike for spending some time with us today, and that would be awesome if you guys can do that. Open a new tab. Don't close out this tab. No, but I'll let's, leave. <laughs> <laughs> and let's let's show a little love over there. Yeah. And uh, while we're talking about YouTube, uh, let's let's get into Q and A now. Uh, but since you guys are here and, and, and uh, we want to reward you for sticking around. So we'll get to your question shortly. Uh, but I just want to let you guys know that, um, you know, this channel is dedicated to helping you with your music. So if you could just uh, hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can never miss another video from the Indie Music Academy. And uh, beyond that, beyond this channel, there is more for you in the description below. There is a free marketing workshop. Uh, that's uh, you know free to you. All you have to do is register and it gets sent right to your inbox. It's three videos, about an hour of training uh, on marketing. Uh, so if you haven't checked that out yet, uh, the link is in the description below this video. Uh, so that's for you just to help you out with your music. And with that, let's dive into questions. If you're still on live, uh, drop your questions in the chat. We are live. We always get that question. Like, is this recorded or can I drop my question in? Yes, you can. This is totally live, not pre-recorded. So uh, let's uh, scroll back up and uh, and hit some questions if that's cool with you, Mike. I'm ready. I All think. right. <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> Marcelo put in a question early. He said, hey, looking forward to this. Uh, his question, I'm wondering if there's any managers we can pitch an audition for um like an actor with an agent i think his question is how would a how would a musician i know he's an actor actually i've had many chats with marcel so marcel is asking just like an actor would find an agent how does a musician find an established manager what's the path well there's one thing to get names and numbers and emails and such the music connection magazine um mm once a year prints a manager's issue and Ooh. and uh, uh you can get some contacts in there mm -hmm. um it's a that's a difficult question to answer because mm -hmm. managers get stuff like that all the time and right they're overloaded probably with yeah, the, yeah. The, the, what managers react to mainly are references like a, uh, a lawyer if hmm. a lawyer is representing a band then somehow it's just different the, the the tough thing for an artist the reason a manager comes in handy uh is you it's tough talking about yourself it's tough right. pitching about yourself it's tough telling people how great you are it doesn't have the same home yeah. as somebody over here saying how great you are right um, so if there's a way of getting a, a, a lawyer friend or a lawyer or um uh, or somebody already in the business calling up a manager saying um so and so you should check out so and so you got a little more oomph to it than directly approaching um yeah. of course that could lead to the question how do you get <laughs> how do you get to uh to some of those people mm -hmm. and the, the the thing i find there first off shows like this which is exceptional it's great that you do this mm -hmm. um there's um uh, uh, conferences music conferences that you can go oh, to absolutely. yeah uh, mm -hmm. and you and you meet people there like crazy and and mm -hmm. you've got a card or you get their card or whatever you know on the phone or whatever it might be uh, I actually still carry some cards with me and I invariably need them every, despite the great electronics of the day yeah. <laughs> they, they yeah. actually, you have a card yeah and I do um, <laughs> and um, so I, I'm not sure I fully answered the question but it it's, it's a matter of getting if you can i mean go directly to the manager too but mm -hmm. chances are slim the manager will get back to you or just say yeah come on over it, it's slim that that will happen but if right. they're getting a reference from somebody else within the industry um you maybe have more of a shot there no that's wonderful advice or, yeah or if they do meet you personally if they do get to talk to you at a conference 
or a, whatever a situation like this, whatever it might be, sometimes that'll uh, make the difference too. That's a great answer. Yeah, hopefully that helps Marcelo. Hope so. Mm -hmm. All right, Erin chatted in. She says, I'm wondering where and how to go about getting my songs critiqued. Thanks for being here. Looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Interesting, yeah. Um, I have an answer to that, but I'll let you go first, Mike. <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, uh, thanks for the question, Aaron. Um, well, there's, boy, your songs will never stop being critiqued. <laughs> first yeah. off, you might as well face that. Uh, even if even if it's number one for six weeks, somebody's going to have something to say about it. But um, uh, yeah, well, like we were saying, some of these conferences are designed mm -hmm. to include uh, and, and having listening sessions and having critique sessions. Um, there's it depends on your kind of music. Uh, I used to be on the board of directors of an orga organization called Folk Alliance International because mm. I'm such a folky. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, they they had a con they have a conference every year. Uh, this year it's in Kansas City in February, I think, and they have critique sessions, and mm -hmm. they also have offshoot. And it's by the way, it's not just it's more singer songwriter than it is folky now. Mm. Uh, and some some great some great writers show up every year, and it, it's it's a talk about a family. It becomes a family. And they'll they'll honestly critique your song. Um, I I've on a uh, every couple of times a year I there are song contests. I judge I judge uh, the songs on a couple of contests, and there's a lot of other contests I'm not on. If you if, go ahead and send your music in there, uh, and you'll get a you'll get a response. Uh, there's just different ways like that. Is that is that what you were going to suggest? Yeah, those are fantastic. Yeah, I've done those competitions and contests before i was going to recommend to aaron that the two um well the two main categories of critique right you can have it critiqued by a person or someone who is giving you kind of like a more formal critique but then there's also the real world critique of actually releasing your songs and seeing how they do in the comments that you get and with social media boy can you get comments <laughs> if you start running facebook and instagram ads you're going to see the critiques roll in. It's always a joke uh, when I work with, uh, you know, the members of my coaching community at the Indie Music Academy that, um, you know, when we're ready to get their ads ready, it's like, whew, prepare for for the uh, the comments to just come out of the weeds, right? The peanut gallery is, is on its way. And you have to have a thick skin. Exactly. Yeah. And so yeah. that's... It was take in, take in the information negative or positive take in the information uh it's hard mm -hmm. to say don't take it personally because it's your song it's so hard not to take it personally yeah but yeah and just know that it's a it's a wild world out there especially on social media and especially with running facebook ads i don't even know how facebook finds the the most uh well the chatty people will just say and uh and there's also some apps and organizations that kind of have more structured critiques like one of them is called uh, nsai which stands for nashville songwriters association international it's a mouthful but they don't exist just in nashville um i was a part of my local nsai chapter in san diego and there's probably a local chapter uh where you live and uh, and that could be easily searched up there's also an nsai newsletter and uh, a, a little search to find your closest chapter. And um, the other thing that you can do is Reverb Nation has a lot of things that are probably not very useful, but that one of their useful things is they have like a anonymous song survey app. I'm really butchering the, the description of this, but you can upload your song and they'll send it to uh, a bunch of anonymous people who kind of rate different elements of your song. like. How is the production? How are the lyrics? And they'll send you back a PDF document with like statistics based off of how um, just the general public received it. And I've always thought that was a really helpful and interesting tool that Reverb Nation offered. And, um, and probably, 
I don't want to bash them too hard, but probably their most useful tool. Uh, so you can always check that out too, Aaron. Hope that helps. Yeah, it's um, the other great way is go to smaller clubs and, oh, good. Mm -hmm. and, and just talk to songwriters. Talk to other songwriters, communicate in whatever way you can with other songwriters. You get critiqued and you learn. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's tough when you go to a bigger concert just to, to meet anybody. But if you're if you're somebody's playing hotel cafe, you know, and they have to walk through the crowd to get to their dressing room. And, and well, you don't you don't want to grab them, you know, but uh, <laughs> you want to you want to say, will you listen or whatever? And and some will and some won't, I guess. But mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. other songwriters uh, critique is sometimes the best just just because they're they they feel what you feel they know what you're doing that's awesome yeah thanks for the question aaron yeah we got a few people just chatting to say hi larry says hi um manager touring agent in la thanks for tuning in larry All right. yeah thanks for tuning in we, we have some comments from earlier so that's a great call. I got the image perfect on the fleece. Punk stigma. Good call. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Your questions coming. Let's see. Oh, here's a good question from Aaron. Well, this is uh, relevant. So, how do you find the family around your music? I'm. I live in Nashville, and the good guys aren't hanging out on Broadway or showing up at the million open mics. How do you find that family if if you're going and no one is really? Uh... That's a tough. Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, I've never lived in Nashville, but I've been there many, many times, and I know that that can be a very closed, mm -hmm. clicky kind of place. When, and, but people work their way in all the time. I think, mm -hmm. you know, you just keep working a bit. It, it's it's like don't become a pest, but if you professionally approach people, it may take a few times to, to make anything click. Um, and what do you mean about um, they aren't hanging out at open mics? Because if they're open mics, there's mean, it means there's songwriters there somewhere. And they may not be big name and hit songwriters yet. Mm -hmm. They may be good. They may be worth talking to and getting to know. The family can grow... Right from a very small little uh, group of people to a big family. And, and uh, uh, I just, you know, I don't know, I don't know how clubs are doing in, in Nashville, if they're still going or back to going or, or not. Mm -hmm. There's a great, oh, yeah. That's uh, a really great point, actually, Mike, that you just uh, brought up. And Aaron, don't always just think it's not worth it if there's not like a big shot songwriter, big shot person there, because the thing with Nashville is that you're going to rise up with your class, right? So yeah. whatever stage you're in right now, find the other people who are at your stage, right? Or at your level, so to speak, or at your same part of your musical journey, right? And those people, the more friends, right? The more people who can join your family uh, you can find, Right, those people will go on to co-write with other artists, and they'll get publishing deals, and they'll, you know, meet someone at an open mic. And if you all stay uh, close and within your class, and you do co-writes with them, I mean, that's probably one of the best things you can do is is write with people who are at your level because you're locking in the relationship through that song. Yeah. And so I wouldn't just, uh, you know, hold out for the the big wig hot shot people and say that's not worth it if no one's here it's definitely still worth it to go to the open mics and to meet your contemporaries now because it's um it's a small small enough town where you can still do that and you can do it, uh, you can do it in la you can do it in la yeah. there's open mm -hmm. mics here and you don't know mm -hmm. where those people are going to be a year from now yes they yeah. may they may they may be number one on the charts a year from now or, or, or whatever, whatever, you know, or maybe they're headlining, uh, 250, 300 seat clubs a year from now, whatever it might be. Um, right. you know, you're meeting people <coughs> because of their talents 
uh, because you like them. Uh, because if, you know, if you don't like the person, you may, you like their music, but you don't like the person, it's going to be difficult to become a family with them. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's just, um, again, I'll go back to my, uh, my saying is activity breeds activity is get, Absolutely. get out of these things and, and meet people and you, you will, you'll fi finally, you'll see, I mean, even now there's, uh, I, there was a great, uh, it's long gone, but there was this great in the early like 2000s or whatever, um, mm -hmm. a singer songwriter Thursday night open mic in, in Los Angeles. And man, it was good. It, it was every Thursday mm -hmm. night I'd go there and uh, there'd be great writers and some of them are going very strong now. Uh, and that kind of became a family. Even now you, you get people showing up and they they remind you or you see you rem remember them from those days um mm -hmm. uh, it's it doesn't i mean uh it's just just get to the you, you mentioned there's a million open mics and get to as many of them as you can and, yeah, and eventually you'll start connecting with certain people and that family will grow mm -hmm. that's a great great answer um yeah fellow says this is awesome Thank you. Yeah. And uh, someone else actually just chatted in uh, your channel. Channel again, please. Sp spell spell it out so they could search it. Gor Gormley Talks. G-O-R-M-L-E-Y Talks. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Definitely uh, head over to his new channel. Show the love. Show the love. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Awesome. And then uh, I always like keeping these things to a crisp hour. So I'm going to just say uh, last chance to get your questions in. Uh, we're here uh, with Mike, a special opportunity for you guys to ask your questions. It's been an hour already. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Holy God. Yeah, and uh, and so, well, just shy, just shy. This is our last call, and, and we'll get some uh, some more great questions in. Okay. Uh, but I just want to thank you guys for uh, tuning in live. Um, and uh, just being here, it, it always makes it so much more fun when uh, when you guys are a part of this, uh, because otherwise we can just upload a, a YouTube video and uh, and pre-record it. But it's always better to have you guys chatting in. So uh, last call to get your questions in uh, and we will uh, get to as many as we can. Let's see. Yeah, we got a lot of comments from. Uh, <laughs> from this subscriber, but he says, don't answer my questions. They're just comments. So I'll, I'll ignore them uh, unless if you uh, specifically uh, request a, a response. Sounds good. And then we got another uh, a compliment from Mary. She says, fantastic interview. Thanks so much for oh. tuning in. I know her. <laughs> I know her. Oh, awesome. Well, thanks for tuning in, Mary. It's so good to have you watching. So Baby Arugula Production says, I came late. Could you quickly summarize what was said about Elfman? <laughs> I mean, you can always rewind to get the full story, but basically Mike uh, convinced Danny Elfman to uh, transition into uh, film scoring uh, from from rock and roll. So if you have any specific questions about that, I'm, I'm sure he would love to go into more. I saw, I saw it as an opportunity to promote Oingo Boingo. I, ah. I thought if he would do well, it would get, you know, more notoriety towards Oingo Boingo and uh -huh. completely overshadowed Oingo Boingo. So. <laughs> it kind of just backfired into his truly successful film scoring career. Yeah. But then uh, Aaron says, thank God you did. He's been a huge influence in film scoring. So yeah. it all works yeah. out. Amazing career. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, and then we're just getting some more uh, just big thanks. I recognize you too have a heart and give good wise advice today. Thank you both. Golden. Yeah, thank you for being here, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so it uh, looks like we are good um, on questions. So I just want to say one last time, uh, just for everyone who's tuning in, thank you for being here. Um, it's uh, just a great help. Go ahead and head over to Mike's brand new channel. Let's just show him some love. Open up a new tab. 
uh, hit subscribe. He's going to share more of his stories, more of his uh, wisdom and music industry tips here on YouTube. So uh, let's just show him some love by being some of the first subscribers to his new channel. That'd be uh, fantastic. And, and Mike, thank you for spending uh, your time with us today and just sharing with uh, all the audience members, I know that they appreciate it. So uh, we, we just uh, want to just shower the love. And if you guys could just give a big thank you to Mike in the comments and uh, let's just show him, you know, a big Indie Music Academy. Thank you, uh, you know, for his time today. And so uh, with that, uh, one last reminder uh, to join the free marketing workshop that we have below. Uh, that's just one button click away and to hit subscribe as well um, to uh, never miss another Indie Music Academy uh, video. And Ocean says, thanks so much. Uh, actually, we did have one last minute question. If you want to take it, we can do it. One last okay. minute question. All right. All right, sweet. Alex just got in the nick of time. His question is, do you think in the advent of streaming services becoming the dominant platform for content and music discovery, should there be greater scrutiny for the streaming platforms as far as view counts? This is like an industry question, right? Do you yeah. think that, that streaming is messing things up? Mm. I think uh, it's more the companies that are not paying writers that are messing things up, in my opinion. Mm. You know, I, I, I don't like I don't like what's happened to the artists in this whole scramble. Um, I yeah. guess, and, and I guess what I'm saying there is. Yeah, there should be greater scrutiny, but really what needs to happen is uh, like the record companies and the streaming services made deals. They did not include the people creating the music in those yeah. deals. Yeah. And those and those people are getting they're getting pushed aside. The creative people are getting pushed aside. And without the creative people, none of the other stuff can happen. But um, but you can't not create just to you know being uh, to be, go up against them so it's a tough situation but i'd rather uh i'd rather that get straightened out yeah i guess i guess the greater scrutiny would would be called for um in the long run to get the writers and artists paid but what mm -hmm. they're getting paid now is absurd yeah seriously that's that's fantastic yeah thanks for giving your uh, insight on that Thank you very much. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we just got some more people says, uh, Mr. Fresh Breeze 50 says at 72 retired, but still making music and an ex Nashville songwriter, plugger and producer. This was really great. Spot on. Thank you, Mike, for your comments. Well, thank you. for Thank you. In. Why are you X? But that's a different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you're still doing it. You're doing it, man. Whatever, doing whatever it. level still it may be. It. Love thank it. you for your comment. Yeah. Thank you. All right, everyone. So yeah, thank you so much, Mike, today. Just uh your your wisdom and the stories are just fantastic about you know the police. We we didn't get into some uh artists actually that I wanted to talk about, but you're just a wealth of information and stories. So um once again, everyone head over to Mike's channel uh to get more uh broken diamonds says flames emojis. <laughs> loves it and one more time mike's channel is uh gormley talks gormley talks um so type that in to uh definitely see and oh for some reason our names aren't showing i don't know i don't know why uh but that's spelled g o r m l e y for everyone who is uh wanting to search that right now so uh with that uh thank you so much for tuning in fire yes you can't hear the applause there is one <laughs> i appreciate Thank that yeah great. thanks for tuning in uh make sure to subscribe to the channels to get updated and with that i just want to say uh best of luck with your music careers best of luck with your artistry with marketing with promoting it's all so hard but uh, just keep the faith keep pushing uh, and believe in yourself so uh, with that thanks for tuning in and we'll see you on a future video on this channel. Take Thank care. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care.